Hey there, guys. It's uh, springtime 2024. Um, we uh, are getting geared up to start uh, planting here and also uh, get the mowers out. And I thought it would be maybe a good time uh, before I got this thing all dirty and started using it for the winter. It's all clean right now and probably good for a video. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about uh, one of my favorite old um, series of riding lawnmowers. Um, uh, and that being the 425, 45, and 55 uh, lawnmower series. So um, I have owned many and many of these over the years, uh, either kind of as project mowers or for my own use, and I just love them. And um, I just wanted to put a video together here for people maybe considering buying one, uh, maybe give you some pointers on kind of good and bad about these mowers and uh, maybe some purchasing tips. Uh, so first, I'll, I'll just get into it here. So um, I'll talk about the good things about this mower first. So um, these are just solid, solid late model mowers. Um, you can't beat these in, on the used market. You know, something like this is going to outlast, um, you know, four or five or six of those junk, um, you know, big box store mowers. Like, th these are the real deal. Um, you know, like uh, Scrub Cadet or Troy Built or Miss the Dumpster, MTD, Crapsman, um, just can't hold a candle to these mowers. They are just awesome. So, um if you, I would much rather buy a used one of these um, than some big box or machine. You'll get more life out of it. It's a nicer platform to use every day. If you take care of it, you'll just get years and years out of it. This mower here that you guys are looking at is um, uh, 25 years old, so this is a 99. And you can see it still looks like new. It runs like new. I have no doubt this thing's going to run for another 20 or 30 years if I can keep parts uh, in it. And um, this guy, I think, is maybe around, um, not quite to a 1,000 hours yet, yeah, 844. So this is a pretty low-hour example of one of these, but it's not uncommon for you to be cruising marketplace and be seeing some of these with two, three, four thousand 4,000 hours on them. Um, so um, some of the good things I wanted to talk about here, guys. Uh, first of all, one of the most important thing, of course, the engine. Um, these are a uh, liquid-cooled Kawasaki 22 horse. I believe they are um, 620 cc's. I think Kawasaki's model for this engine is actually the FD620D. Um, great solid engine in here. Um, I've got a few pointers for it later I'll talk about, but overall a great little uh, power plant in these. Um, the uh, engine and the uh, hydrostat and hydraulic system are liquid cooled so no worrying about you know a crappy um, you know air cooled you guys have probably seen these cheap hydrostats on the big box store machines where your uh, hydrostatic system just has like a crummy little plastic fan up on the top that a belt spins um, these are legit liquid cooled beefy um, transaxles um, Kenzaki, uh, Japan, Tough Torque, you might recognize this brand. Um, and uh, yeah, um, great, uh, great transmissions here. Um, there's a shaft, you know, that runs directly off the crank um, that uh, runs uh, the input to the, um, I can't quite get quite all the way up there um, to see it, but runs right up into the, um, back of the transaxle and then there's your PTO shaft that runs forward up to your deck to a, a gearbox. So um, you know no belts to fail, you just got a few U-joints that you have to keep greased. Um, and uh, yeah, very tough commercial grade system there. Um, another positive on these, mach these machines, they're pretty easy to work on. Um, so you can um, I'll take the, maybe the grill off later so you guys can kind of see the access here. But um, if you take this kind of um, the grill off and this front structure uh, of the um, grill frame there, you can get to the whole front of the engine. So, like, you can get in there and, uh, you know, replace shaft seal or if you've got to pull the whole timing cover off, 
because of, uh, you know, the, uh, you have to look at the cam gear or something like that. You can really do some major engine surgery on these if you have to um, with keeping the engine in the tractor and just kind of pulling that front clip off, which is pretty nice. Um, the cooling pack is, I kind of showed this before, it's kind of in the rear of the, it, your kind of layout here goes uh, kind of battery, muffler, engine, cooling package. Um, the cooling pack being in the back here is actually pretty nice um, because, you know, you can get and you can kind of do some of that major engine surgery without, um, you know, having to pull all your cooling system apart and get all that stuff out of the way first, which is pretty nice. Um, the other thing is that, you know, this is a legit um, body on frame mower, so you guys can see the framework on this thing you know it's like quarter inch or five sixteenths inch thick steel um, like ladder that runs all the way down the full length of the tractor I mean it is a it's a rigid um, it's a rigid structure and then your body work kind of sits on top of that so it's not like one of these um, kind of stamp jobs where um, kind of your fender deck and your sheet metal is kind of also doubles as the uh, you know the tractor frame um, these have a real frame. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier in the video, though, guys. I think, I think these mowers were made from '94 to '01. Um, the one I have here is a '99, um, just for reference. Um, there's all kinds of attachments available for these: um, snow blowers, um, snow blowers, sweepers, tillers. Um, on the tiller, I should mention, you can also get this tractor just not equipped with it, but um, you might, you guys might have seen some of these with like a limited Cat 1 um, hitch on the back, the three-point hitch on the back where you could do like garden tilling with. And um, those have a different um, kind of transaxle cover in the back there that has an output on it for that. Um, so that's, uh, that's an option if you guys... Uh, are interested in uh, having doing tilling with these and also um, you know you could get loaders front loaders for these too so I think they kind of mounted where that this bracket is um, you might know that you know like on the current um, I don't know when they stopped exactly maybe the X uh, 720 or 730 in that range, you, you, you no longer can get loaders uh, for these, but these older ones you can. Um, the reason for that is the, um, there's that ISO rollover protection requirement. So you guys might have noticed that um, some of the latest like all wheel seared diesels, um, you know, that went away with the latest series and you know, you're kind of forced to buy like the one series tractor now. Um, which is kind of that little subcompact with a loader. And then you might notice it has a, like a ROPS on it, um, a ROPS bar, which you see people driving around within their yards with it down, which I don't understand. But um, yeah, I think that, uh, that kind of limits loader capability on new newer machines, but these old ones don't have an issue with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, you know, the predecessors to these, the 420, 430, those were good machines too, but um, just kind of a little, maybe a little bit more archaic and clunkier, old school design, uh, kind of more like a Simplicity Sunstar, um, you know, kind of a compilation of components that don't quite work together as well as this. I would say like once the, sorry, I got interrupted there guys, someone stopped up at the shop. Um, I think what I was saying was um, when the the 425, 45, 55 came out, this really kind of established the layout and basic components of even what you see in a modern X7 series tractor today. So like a you know 720, 730, um, you know the Kawasaki engine, the Kanzaki uh, transaxle. Um, all that good stuff, kind of the general layout of the machine is all really similar. Um, so you can kind of draw the heritage back of even the current mowers sold today at the dealer um, to these. Um, so um, the other thing, this is maybe a minor one, guys, but I don't know about you, but I really like 
how these old Horicon built mowers here kind of mimicked the styling of the row crop, you know, tractors of the of the time. So I've got a 7410 sitting in the back here, um, hooked up to the planter. Um, you know, that, that machine I think is a 99, same year as this one. And I just love that they kind of keep that same uh, hood line and kind of graphics. And, you know, you guys who are uh, farmers too know that these 10 series tractors are just an awesome old machine. You know, maybe arguably, uh, some people would say the best uh, tractors Deere has ever made, these old 10 series tractors, pre-emissions, uh, mechanical injection pumps, limited computers. So it kind of, you know, harks back to, um, you know, these these uh, Horicon riders at the time too. Um, just, uh, yeah, great, great uh, baby, uh, baby brother to the, to the big guys. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, maybe back on the cooling guys, is there's a lot of nice um, perf on the hoods and back behind um, the steering column here for the cooling package draws the air in. And um, the, the radiator sizing and hydrostat um, cooling capacity is great. Um, you know, I've used these for years and years and I have never um, overheated one of these when it wasn't my fault. Like I wasn't, um, say I wasn't keeping the debris off the perf well enough. Um, if you keep that perf clean, um, the cooling capacity is just great. Okay, um, just wanted to maybe talk about some of the weak points of these. Um, I wouldn't say I really dislike anything about this mower, but um, I, I would say there's some things that they've improved in later years that um, um, you notice as you work on the newer ones. One of the things I would mention, guys, is this hood plastic. Um, is pretty fragile. So um, it's a pretty, let me raise the hood again here. You guys kind of look at the, um, this hood plastic. It's, it's not very ductile. And, um, it, you know, if, it, if you bump a tree or it contacts anything, um, the, hood, the upper hood and these side shields are kind of a separate piece that you pull off. There's little tabs down at the bottom that lock in um, to the top of the frame that are really um, prone to breaking off, especially if you've got someone handling these that aren't used to the mower or how to get it apart or how to set it down. I mean, if you're careful with the stuff, it's fine, but as you guys know, nobody's careful with anything, and um, they just get all bashed up. So um, the plastic, I would say, is kind of a weak point on these. Um, one thing I should mention, guys, if you do buy one of these, and this is your first one, um, when you're transporting it home on your trailer, I usually will put like a um, like a towel down over the top of the hood and then a big bungee strap all the way down from, you know, the hood, and I'll kind of hook it under the footrest to hold the hood down because I've seen many, many times where people have hauled these and the hood has flopped up on the highway and just torn the hood off. And th th these plastics are not cheap. So make sure you're tying everything down when you're transporting it. It's also a good idea to run some tape across your um, taillight lenses so they don't blow out. Or, um, and maybe even your toolbox lid, I've seen those ripped off as well. Th this, this style, not so much as like the newer X7s, but um, yeah, just keep keep that in mind if you're going to purchase one of these. Bring some things along to make sure you don't um, tear any of this stuff off on the way home. Um, another weak point I've noticed um, on the gas ones anyway, I don't think this is an issue on the, the 455 diesel, but um, the muffler on these gets so hot, and it's kind of right in front here, it kind of might be a little hard to see there, but you can... Maybe you, hopefully you guys can see how like these um, plastic fins are distorting. And um, you see this on every one of these, um, you know, these 425, 445s that have been run in the summer. It kind of distorts this, this section of, um, of your grill. And, um, you know, if you, this, I think this is a replacement grill on this one, but um, on a factory OEM grill that has been used for 20 years, they'll really be flared out and it'll kind of look kind of crummy. Sometimes they'll crack. Um, so that's something to be aware of as a weak point. The grills are actually not quite as expensive as, 
as the side shields and the hood tops, um, but still probably at least 100, 150 bucks to, um, to get them. And, and of course, they don't come with decals or anything, so you still got to go to the dealer and kind of get the decals for them separate too. So it's just kind of a pain. Um, you can kind of see the battery through the grill here, guys. So on the 425, 445, they use a standard like lawnmower U1 size battery. Um, and uh, it, it does the job, but you guys know these U1s don't really last that long. And um, um, the diesel models use the, the bigger uh, full-size battery, kind of more like... Um, like a like a 345 or um, kind of some of the older smaller machines used where the battery kind of sits up where the cooling pack sits on this machine use a bigger battery Th that's a much nicer battery you get some good cranking power especially in the winter um, so that's kind of a negative of the 25 45 one of these days I might try to maybe see if I can fit the diesel battery in here um, I don't know if it's if it starts getting too close to the muffler and that's why it wasn't offered from the factory but uh, maybe someone who has tried this can comment on it for me and uh, maybe this is uh, an upgrade I need to make to mine sometime um, I am going to pause the video here for a second guys and pull the um, plastic off so that we can talk through some of the engine stuff and uh, we're not trying to look through plastic so one second here all right, guys, here's just a better shot of um, kind of what the, the small U1 battery looks like installed in the uh, kind of the front end on these. And then you guys can kind of see this structure now that I was talking about earlier that, um, you know, you can kind of move that, <clears throat> remove that grill uh, structure off and hood and hood support and muffler. And um, you can kind of see then you really have really nice access to the whole front of the engine here. Uh, once that's removed so you can pull this timing cover off um, you could get in there and do any engine heart surgery if you have to uh, which is pretty nice okay um, of course uh, one of these 425 445 videos would not be complete without um, addressing the plastic cam gear issue so um, the plastic cam gear is a problem on I believe the 94 to 99 models and I know I've got this written down somewhere I'll insert a picture in this uh, video here so that um, it's clear on exactly when the serial number break was because I don't think it was I don't think it was a serial break by model year I think it happened mid-year and um, I will get you that and I think actually to confirm for sure I believe you have to look at the engine build date and you can find that on the, the air cleaner cover here. Um, I know when I bought this tractor, I looked it up and made sure that it had the steel cam gear before I bought it. So I've never actually been into this one for the cam. Um, but uh, just to give a little history on this issue here, um, if you have one of those affected earlier models, you're almost guaranteed a cam gear failure and it's going to happen in that 800 to 1,000 hour range. I, I don't know if I've ever seen one go blow before that or after that. It's a pretty tight window, actually. And um, what happens is um, it, it almost always happens right at startup. So, you know, the, um, the, the person starting it will say, um, I cranked it and... Um, it was cranking and it didn't start and all of a sudden it backfired and um, uh, would not run. It's, it's almost always at startup is when the teeth shear off and um, what happens is the uh, crank, the crank, uh, the steel crank gear um, chews all the teeth off the cam in a certain location and uh, it might run and skip or it just might chew them off in a certain spot and it might not spin at all um, and what happens is you get a whole pile of plastic um, teeth that end up down sitting in the crankcase pan and you've got to pull the timing cover off um, to get in there and clean everything out and um, 
install a new cam and uh, there's probably going to be some bent uh, push rods that you've got to replace at the same time. Um, so you guys have probably heard this, uh, heard about this if you've been shopping for these at all. Um, and I would say that um, it's not a, t it shouldn't be something that I guess discourages you from buying one of these, but you've got to get the tractor cheap enough. So, it, it, you know, if it's one of those early models and the tractor is, um, you know, getting close to that 800 hour mark and the person you're buying it from doesn't know, you know, it's, it, it could be a time bomb. So um, one thing I, di I have found though is that if you buy one and the person you're buying it from doesn't know whether it's got the steel cam gear or not, I believe um, this is a trick I haven't done recently, but I know you can pull this water pump cover off you're going to lose coolant to check this, but you can look in there and you can see the cam teeth, the cam gear teeth. And actually the water pump, the governor, and the oil pump are also plastic gears, but there's less load on them, so this problem never happens. The problem always happens on the cam. But once you pull the water pump off, you can kind of look in there and you can see enough of the cam gear to know. So. The other thing to mention, guys, is that the cam gear on these is not, it's not, it doesn't look obviously like white plastic. It's more of like a, kind of like a metallic brown appearance. So, um, you know, put a magnet on it to make sure if you're not, if you don't know what you're looking at, to make sure that it's um, steel. Um, so that's, that's a trick for you guys uh, if you want to verify. Um, but I would say that, you know, if you're buying one of these early ones and you're, and you're unsure if it's been done or you know it hasn't been done, you know, you've got to get the mower cheap enough to warrant going through the job of replacing the cam gear. So, you know, it's going to take probably, you know, it's at least a good six hour job. Uh, you got to pull quite a bit of the front part of the engine and this grill apart to get in there and do the work. Um, and, um, I believe um, the last time I did one of these, the kit was maybe, the, the best thing to do was like just go to uh, Fleabay and um, Google like, you know, 445 cam gear kit and it'll come with a cam and um, push rods and heavier valve springs and a gasket set. It'll, they're pretty nice kits that these, that these deer dealers are putting together and, and selling on there that kind of have everything you need in one shot. Um, or you can go to your dealer, um, but you'll probably have to kind of identify all the gaskets you need ahead of time, which can be a little time consuming to poke through parts catalog and figure out what you all need. Um, so um, that is, that's my cam gear spiel. So hopefully that was informational for you guys. Um, some of the other weak points, guys, is um, occasionally um, you'll you'll run into one of these where there'll be kind of oil on the ground back behind your hydrostat here, kind of dripping out of these. Um, usually the cause are these linkages that kind of come into the side of the, of the uh, transaxle here. And um, that it, usually it's not a huge deal. You can get in there and uh, push, a new, push a new shaft seal on over the shaft. I mean, the access isn't great in there because you're kind of trying to work up in this really small area. But, you know, if you're patient with it, um, and usually I put a little bit of that green um, kind of press fit Loctite on the new shaft seal when I press it up in there to make sure it doesn't push out. Um, usually um, it's, it's also a good time to check if you pull your uh, fender deck off. I believe there's a breather um, on the top of the transaxle too. Just so make sure that breather is clear and the seal didn't push out because um, you know your head pressure and the transaxle got high because the breather was clogged. I guess if always check that if you have a hydrostat leak issue with one of these. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, you guys might know that the 425 is a carbed um, mower and the 445 you get uh, this kind of little, I, th I believe it's a Bosch or a Denso fuel injection system uh, with the mower. And I love the, I, I really prefer the 445 over the 425 because I, I believe they're a little bit higher compression. 
I think they were rated around two horsepower more. And um, the fuel injection system just really makes it for, you know, easy, trouble-free starting. You know, family members who don't know how to use a choke, um, it's just you turn the key and it starts. Um, no educating anyone on how to start, start it up. And, um, you know, I believe on these that, uh, you know, there is... You know, there is a sensing system here with, um, you know, pressures and um, temperatures and, you know, feedback that gets kind of sent back to this ECU that sits to the left side of the steering column here. Um, but I wouldn't let that discourage you guys from, um, you know, buying the carbed one. I guess I have never really had a fuel system related issue with one of these where it was actually because of the um, the ECU or the the system itself. Usually, you know, if you do have a fueling issue with one of these, it's like a um, um, the the fuel pump is is not delivering fuel, so these have an in tank um, fuel pump um, on them. And usually, what I see happen is um, there's a little connecting hose inside the fuel pump that um, kind of draws from the fuel sock and then pushes, you know, the fuel up to the um, injector. Um, I've seen that hose split open quite often, and what you can do, guys, if you're suspicious of that happening, if you're kind of getting um, like a lean surge or something on these, you know, take the fuel cap off, and when you key on, the fuel pump will run. We can just do it here a little bit. I don't know if you guys could hear that or not, but you know that when you key on the fuel pump will run for a few seconds to prime the system up and um, uh, just put your ear up to your fuel filler there and listen. And if you've got an issue with, with that fuel pump um, hose connection, you'll actually hear the fuel spraying around in there. Um, so that could be a good test. Um, or, you know, it could be a plug fuel filter. I think, I believe alongside the left-hand frame rail, I don't have the deck off here, so it's hard to see, but up in the left frame rail, there's a fuel filter up there. That can be um, plugged up, um, or you could have a kinked line. Um, your fuel cap breather could be plugged, uh, which is kind of starving the, the fuel system. So in almost every instance I've had, guys, with fueling system issues with, with the 445s, is it wasn't because of the electronics. Um, unless, you know, water or corrosion in one of these connectors was causing an issue or mice got in here. I've seen this before, too, where mice have gotten in here and chewed up some of these sensor connectors. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would say overall a really robust system, kind of if you keep everything clean and dry, you keep the mice out of them, and you keep your uh, fuel pump uh, pumping like it should, you just really won't have many issues with these. Um, I have had a couple of these guys where um, after you pressure wash them, they start up crappy. Like it'll be running on, it won't either won't start at all, or it'll kind of be popping on one cylinder. Um, one thing I have run into with that, especially with the old valve covers, the old plastic valve covers. We'll talk about that later. Um, this one has the update. But um, the old plastic valve covers will leak engine oil down out of the, the seal there, and this, uh, your spark plug boot will swell up. And you'll lose, you'll lose the seal there between this rubber and the porcelain in your plug, and water will get in there and um, screw up your ignition supply. And... Um, you know, after you kind of let the tractor sit out in the sun for a few hours, it'll start up and run fine like nothing happened. But um, most of the time, this is what I've found the issue is if it's, if it's only after you wash it. It could also be water kind of getting into one of these connectors. So these are also good to check, too. Um, but I would, I would say more often I found that it's this uh, spark plug boot. And this is another thing, guys. You can just buy this piece here, this... Uh, this NGK, um, this plastic connector with these two boots on it are all available separately from Deer Parts. You can just, um, and it's just threaded on. So you, pull, you pop it off, you turn the, uh, the boot counterclockwise, and it'll turn right out of the wire, turn the new one on, 
and you're good to go. So um, maybe uh, as another weakness, and this probably wasn't a weakness until the X7s came out, but um, you, you guys might know that what replaced these were kind of the new tilt hood, the complete tilt hood versions, and you know they were called the 485, 495, uh, 585, 595. Um, I believe when those came out, the wheelbase stretched a little bit. So, um, I w and I think maybe the f the frame is definitely less stiff on the X7s. You definitely don't see these, you know, really solid, you know, quarter inch, five sixteenths inch thick uh, steel frame on the sevens. And um, I would say the extra wheelbase and having a little bit more frame flex on the seven hundreds, the I guess I should say anything after these, the 485 to the 700s, do ride better. Um, if you've got a rough yard, that could be a consideration. These still ride way better than if you guys have ever run like the um, 318s, 332s. Those are just a really rigid, stiff, short wheelbase um, tractor that would rattle your teeth out. You know, these are night and day compared to that. But, um, you know, the X7s with the fancy new seats and... Um, kind of the wheelbase really do ride nice. It's hard to beat them. Um, one thing um, to mention here too is the cooling pack here, guys, has this, um, it's got this nice screen here and you wanna blow this out after every time you use the tractor. Uh, I, I use compressed air and blow that, blow that screen out of there. Um, trying to do this with one hand, guys, I'm kind of fumbling around. Um, and, uh, yeah, you want to blow this out every time you use the tractor and every time you're done. Um, and sometimes, um, what I'll do is if, uh, maybe every second or third, I'll actually use a, uh, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of these before. Um, this is called an air comb. So I believe the company that sells these is IPA. Um, innovative products of America. I think that's what it was called. Um, th those are the guys who sell like that grease joint rejuvenator where you, you can hammer um, a machine oil into grease fittings to try to unplug grease fittings. But um, they make a, a several nice products, but one of them that I do really like is this air comb. So it kind of gives you this nice long um, rod, and you can see there's these air holes kind of at the end of the end of the tube here. And what you do is you kind of stick this in here and you can really, you can blow 90 degrees off this nozzle and blow all the garbage out of your cooling pack. Um, and you can, you know, you can use it on the back side of the cooling pack. You can get it in here and you can blow it on the fan side if you want and really try to push all the material out. Um, if you just have a regular, like, you know, blow gun, you're going to have a hard time getting in there in like the center of the cooling pack and getting all the grass and debris out of there. Um, since, I've, since I've got one of these, um, I use them all the time now for um, getting in here even on, on ag tractors. And sometimes if you've got an ag tractor with like a, a split cooling pack where there's like a gap um, between like the hydraulic system and the radiator or the condenser, sometimes you can stick this air comb in here between the gaps and really blow everything out. And it kind of saves you some time because you're not... Um, say having to take the machine down completely and pressure wash it thoroughly um, as often. So um, it's kind of nice to use air um, kind of for the intermediate cleans. Um, the other thing, maybe this is another thing that really wasn't a weak point until the sevens came out, but uh, you guys might know that I believe in 02, when that 485, 495 um, series came out, you could get four wheel drive. I believe those were I believe the 95s denoted the four-wheel drive. Um, personally, you know, I think that for a lawnmower, if you need four-wheel drive, um, you must be on some pretty wicked stuff. <laughs> and I would say two-wheel drive really um, does the job for most things. Um, it, you have a simpler front axle, you know, that doesn't require as much maintenance. There's no drive system or hubs up there. Um, you know, and especially if you got a big, like, full chassis mower like this with diff lock and some decent tires, you can really go almost anywhere you need with one of these. You just have to kind of 
remember how you're positioning yourself when you're going downhill. Um, but anyway, um, I would say that's that's about it for the weak points here, guys. Um, oh, one thing I did miss though um, is the decks. So, you know, the back in the day here, guys, when these mowers were were made, um, the kind of the flat top seven iron designs had not been out yet. You know, so you you guys might be able to see this is a 54 inch on this mower here, but you can kind of see how there's like this flat lower area of the deck. And then the bl the tips of the blades, kind of as they go towards the front of the deck, they enter this tunnel that's kind of full height. So if you guys look at like a modern deck, you'll notice that like the whole deck is the same height as this tunnel part here. And I guess what I found with these um, these older decks, like the 48, 54, and 60 inch, that kind of have this um, this lower part with the tunnel up front is that especially if you're in kind of tall wet grass you know a lot of us uh, you know ideally we'd always like to mow in the daytime when it's driest but sometimes you're trying to get you're trying to get a few hours in after work to get things knocked down and you're kind of fighting the dew um, in the evening and um, what I notice happens is like in this lower section especially the middle blade and this outer blade on your left side um, the grass really collects in there and you can hear the blades kind of hitting the clumps of grass as they're building up inside and it really gets gummed up and you've got to get into a kind of a lower drier area a lower height drier area before it'll kind of clean itself out again whereas I really I never have issues with that with my uh, more modern decks with the flat top at the seven irons um, so um, I would say of the of the three decks that you could get with these uh, back at this time, I would say the 60 inch is the is the beefiest and most durable one. Um, if you can tolerate the wider deck width, um, go with the 60 inch. I've a, I've got the 54 on this one because I um, I kind of these days don't really use this one for my bulk mowing anymore. I kind of use it for kind of cleaning up the ditches where I kind of need the narrower width. Okay, um, all right, guys. So that's that kind of covers the kind of my good and the good good and the weak points about these. I did want to talk a little bit about maybe up recommended upgrades. So probably my number one or one of my favorite upgrades for doing to these. You guys might know that when you know back in the day, these were typically most of the time just came with turf turf tires front and rear, like the Carlisle Multi Track CS front and rear sometimes you would see you know some of these with bar tires in the back i don't like bar because i feel like in the springtime um, when the when the ground is is wet or even in the summer after you've gotten a hard rain that the bar just tears up um, the your your lawn too much especially when you're turning sharp around trees but i really think that the um the heavy duty all purpose style tire, like kind of the gator pattern tire here, is really a nice compromise. You get really nice traction. It's less aggressive on chewing up the lawn, but it gives you plenty of traction. So my favorite ones of, of this pattern, guys, are the Carlisle HD Field Tracks. Um, these are the 26 by 12 by 12 size. Um, I just of, of all the tires I've tried, these are my favorite tires. I, it's definitely worth upgrading these. Um, it's just a completely different mowing experience if you have hills, if you have steep hills that you're mowing on. Um, I will say, though, guys, um, these tires are very, very difficult to mount. Um, typically, when I get them, the um, maybe it's just me, but whenever I get these, the beads are are very um, pushed in. It's almost like when these come from the manufacturer, they're stacked, you know, ten high in a trailer, and the weight of them pushes the beads way in. And what you end up with once you get the tire mounted, you've got this huge gap between the back of the rim and the tire. And um, if you guys are going to attempt to mount these on your own. Um, do yourself a favor and buy a bead blaster because um, you're not going to be able to get them mounted without a bead blaster. So you guys probably know what I'm talking about. Cheetah is probably the most common brand. This one's in a bag, but here, let me so you guys can see. It's like those compressed air tanks with a nozzle and a quick action open valve. 
Um, and sometimes I've even had to um, put ratchet straps around them plus the bead blaster to get these to seat. So uh, be prepared for a fight if you guys do these on your own, but I will say um, it's worth the fight. Once you get them mounted, you'll love them. Um, weak point number two, or uh, I, I should say recommended upgrade number two, um, is um, you guys are immediately going to be aggravated with how slow these mowers back up. Um, if you've ever been on a X700 and you're expecting that kind of reverse speed, you're going to be disappointed that they, these only kind of run at about half speed in reverse as forward. And um, this one's been updated already, but from the factory, there'll just be a little triangular shaped pedal here um, that sticks up. And um, when you step on reverse with your foot and you push down on it, that pedal um, kind of just becomes flat with the floorboard and you can't get any more downward stroke on it. Even though, you know, the hydrostat itself, the linkage underneath, has physically has more travel that it can, that it can move. That little pedal uh, and bottom of your foot is, um, is all the travel you can get on the thing. So sometimes, guys, you'll see people, like, putting a bolt in the top of that thing to get more travel out of it, which looks like heck. But um, there's plenty of guys out there. If you guys just kind of cruise Flea Bay and you type... Uh, you know, 445 high speed reverse pedal. There's guys making these little retrofit kits that's a, a pedal with an arm. And some of them even, even use the factory deer um, pedal uh, or uh, pedal pad on it um, so that your forward and reverse match. Um, I think there's maybe adjustable versions too. I kind of just like the fixed one here. But um, that is definitely an upgrade that um, you're going to want to do if you've got any reversing to do. In your yard or or you've been spoiled with the x7 speed um, this will get you right back up to the x7 speed um, I kind of touched on this one earlier guys but um, from the factory these engines came with plastic valve covers so um, especially the side with the oil fill oil fill on the left side of the engine there was like a big um, kind of funnel that uh, or riser coming off the valve cover to get it up above kind of the height of where the side shield sat so you could fill oil easier. And what would happen is that, uh, you know, the top of that riser would just kind of vibrate as, as you're using the machine. And I think it just put too much stress on this, the plastic valve cover here. And it would, it would kind of open up in this joint between your bolts here and kind of keep, the plastic would keep creeping. And then you get oil running all over your plugs and making your boots swell and, just making a big mess of your engine. So, you know, when you look at an engine, you guys want it to look like this. You want it to be bone dry everywhere. When you see leaks, address them. And, you know, keep that shaft seal replaced. And um, you just, you don't want oil leaking everywhere and just, you know, making the engine run hotter and kind of getting into your harnesses and everything. So um, they, they make a, um, an aluminum valve cover upgrade kit for these. Um, you don't have to do both sides. You know, if you're just trying to address that, the, the most common issue on the left side with that riser, you can just buy the left side cap, which has the oil fill plug in it. Um, I usually just do them both because I like the appearance of the common appearance. This is what it's really the, the right side is the, actually the same part, but, um, you know, it's not bored for the plug. Um, and I should also mention, guys, that um, these use a different type of ga uh, gasket, too. So the, the original plastic black ones had a uh, O-ring between the valve cover and the cylinder head. These kind of use that kind of silver, kind of graphite-looking uh, material that's just a flat gasket. And this is another one. If you flea bay it, you just, you know, say uh, you search... Um, 445 al aluminum valve cover upgrade kit. This will pop up. It's pretty reasonably priced, I thought, last time I had to do one, and definitely worth your money for longevity of your machine. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, guys, was the... Um, I know this is a real minor upgrade, but I believe the 445s in this, or, you know, 425, this the 400 series here, I don't think that they came with... Um, nylon caps on top of the spindle so like when you're pressure washing this thing at the end of the season and cleaning it up um, 
you you know you can inadvertently force water down the spindle and um, which is not good uh, when you when you grease these later you'll kind of see the water forcing out um, I like to add um, these nylon caps to them to keep the gunk out um, and and it also just kind of keeps all the grass and crap from collecting on the top of of um, of the spindle where kind of the grease oozes out it just keeps everything looking cleaner and um, this isn't a deer part but um, if you just if you just kind of google like nylon plastic cap I got two of them in a bag here that are left over from a bunch I ordered a while back and I believe the what I ordered for these was um, an inch and three quarter ID inch and a half length and I believe that's just about this one's kind of pushed up a little bit. I believe that's just about the perfect fit for these. So, yeah, an inch and three quarter ID and an inch and a half tall. You can see how well that fits. And you really, you don't want it too long because, you know, you can see there's a radius there on the casting that it's going to hit there pretty soon. You know, maybe the thing could be a quarter inch longer and still work, but um, that's kind of about the size you're going to want to look for. Um, and the last upgrade I wanted to mention here guys was the um, the uh, LEDs so um, th these tractors you know don't have any the nice thing here is they don't have like any computer control of the lights you know looking for like a certain range of resistance it, you guys know like when you just try to put LEDs into a late model car sometimes they won't work because they're processor controlled and they're looking for a certain current draw you know these don't these are just a, a switch um, they don't have a problem with that so um, I've got um, the upgraded LEDs in the headlights and the tail lights on this one and it just if you if you kind of get caught mowing at night or at dusk it is really nice to have the better lighting and um, just kind of also kind of gives the appearance of a nice uh, newer more modern mower so um, I think, guys, that was about the end of my kind of 445 uh, um, tribute here, <laughs> tribute or overview. Um, maybe just in closing, I just wanted to close with, um, you know, there's a lot of people who just love these mowers. And, you know, some would argue these, these were the best riders that uh, riding mowers that deer ever made. Um, you know, if you get a if you get one of these that's been taken care of, it'll just give you years and years and years of of good service. Like like I mentioned before, this guy is 25 years old, and I have no doubt that this thing is going to run to two or three thousand hours. Uh, maybe it'll outlive me. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess the only maybe caution I have for picking one of these up, guys, is make sure you're knowledgeable about the plastic cam gear issue. Um, if you are going to get one where it's uncertain or you know it has the plastic, make sure you get it at a low enough price that justifies going through the labor and parts of, of updating it. Um, if it's a lower hour machine that's in good shape, it's probably well worth your time and it's really not that, tip, that bad a job if you're um, mechanically inclined or even reasonably mechanically inclined. Uh, my other kind of caution, guys, is... Um, um, so certain parts on these are starting to reach um, kind of the point where deer isn't is dropping them as active service parts. So um, I think maybe as these age into their 30 and 40 years old, it's going to be harder and harder to find parts for them like, like anything. Um, I would say for any of the common stuff that you have to replace, you know, hoods, filters, uh, most engine parts, um, a lot of the stuff is still available. And I know the guys in, in Horicon there are, um, you know, trying to keep everything alive because they know what kind of fan base that there is for these and that how many of them are still in use today. Um, but just something to keep in mind that, um, you know, as the years wear on here, it might get a little harder and harder to find parts for them. But at least for now in 2024, don't let that discourage you of, of kind of experiencing how great a mower these old, these old guys were. So... Uh, that is the end of the video here, guys. Um, I hope um, I hope I said something in here that was uh, helpful for you. I'm sure there were things that I missed. I kind of 
went through this uh, and kind of just made a page of notes for myself on just kind of things I've experienced over the years. Um, feel free to kind of comment on this video with your own experiences or things that maybe I missed to help other uh, viewers of this, uh, of this video. So um, have a great day, guys. Uh, spring is coming. We're going to be planting here in no time. And um, yeah, happy wrenching and have a good day.